Um, I am an endocrinologist, so my special area is growth, puberty, that sort, that sort of thing. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, it's always difficult being the speaker, at least in this case, after the words of the best speaker. <laughs> so, uh, brilliant. Christy, where's Christy gone? I think oh, she's gone to help. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, we're here supposed professionals, uh, but actually you guys are the experts. And uh, whenever I attend family days, be it for this condition or other conditions that, uh, that I'm involved in, <laughs> I, I come here to, uh, to listen and learn. However, I will share a few things about growth with you. And uh, as Christy has pointed out, you actually don't have to believe any of them. <laughs> and you can certainly ask me anything about it that you like. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall growth performance, particularly in Costello, uh, and then some uh, comments about managing the short stature. Okay. So I think you probably, most of you will be familiar with growth charts and you probably maybe even keep your own growth chart for your child and of course everybody gets issued with the red book um, and uh, you know that's a, a nice little thing to keep up to date with them. So this is a breakdown of a growth chart, a height chart going from birth over on the left hand side here to adulthood over on the right hand side and what I've done to simplify it is just to take out the average growth line. So um, when a child is born, they actually come out of the womb growing really, really fast. And they continue to grow very fast in the first year or so of life, but then start to slow down. And uh, so I've come back to the Costello, but obviously Costello babies are quite big and then they slow down. And this phase of growth is always thought to be primarily driven by nutrition, by the food, the milk that the baby receives. And then as you start to get into childhood, so from about two years onwards, the growth trajectory is much flatter. And that's when it's not just the food that goes into the child, but also the hormones and growth hormone thyroid hormone are really important in order to maintain that growth trajectory. Then you get up to this point here, which is the start of the teens or the start of puberty anyway. And uh, as well as all the physical changes of puberty uh, and the exchange of your lovely child for a ghastly teenager, what you also get is the growth spurt. And uh, the growth spurt, then uh, once that's over, that's when growth finishes. So <clears throat> it's the hormones, the sex hormones of puberty that actually fuse off the bones and stop growth. Otherwise, we'd all be 20 foot tall. So it's those hormones. So if you, for, for one reason or another, didn't have a properly timed puberty, you can carry on growing and growing and growing. So it's the process of going through puberty that will lead to the end of growth. So um, that's what uh, a growth curve looks like. And I've also put right over on the right hand side, parental target range. So if you are tall parents, you will have tall children. And if you're tall parents and you have a child with CFC or Costello, then you will impart part of your tallness to those children. So if you're tall parents, it's likely that your CFC child will be at the upper end of the CFC uh, range. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, just on here, what I've demonstrated on the left-hand side, and you don't need to look at all the detail, but these are the ages and the stages of puberty for a girl and for a boy. 
And the girls down the bottom here, they tend to start their puberty about a year earlier than boys, on average at about 11. And they go into their growth spurt quite early on. And then they have their puberty, their men are, their first period, on average a couple of years after they've started puberty. Boys, on the other hand, go into their puberty uh, a little bit later, around 12. And they have to be a little bit further into their puberty before they get their growth spurt. So that's why you'll, you'll notice in the kids in secondary school, the girls, when they first get to secondary school, are all terribly tall and mature. And the boys always look very young and immature. Uh, and that's because of this discrepancy in, in natural puberty. Um, over on the right hand side, this very high tech piece of equipment with the ellipsoids is what I use to measure balls as the boy is going through puberty. So it's, it's my ballometer. The technical term is orthodometer. And the blue ellipsoids are little balls, prepubertal. And then when you hit yellow at four, that's when you get into puberty. And as you go round the circle there and the testes get bigger, that's when the growth spurt starts to come along. So from very um, high tech materials, I can tell an awful lot about where your child is up to in terms of puberty. Down on the right, bottom right hand side, I've got two hand x-rays. And what we use those for is to get an idea of how old the body is compared to how old the child is. So if you have a hormone disorder or a delay in your puberty, your bones mature less quickly than normal. So for instance, if you had a problem with growth hormone, a child with shorter growth hormone, and they were 10 years old, you might take the wrist x-ray, compare that to normal standards, and find actually that the bones were nearer a six-year-old's. And of course, that's a good thing to have. If you've got young bones, it means there's room for growth. So that's a, a simple test, a simple x-ray that we do as part of the whole process of evaluating growth, puberty, and maturity. Uh, and that's, oh yes, so what I've done there is just demonstrated how we use that on a growth chart. So this is the height of the child at a given age, but that's their bone age, which is actually on this chart a couple of years back. So it shows that for the bones, this child is actually quite tall, even though they look a little bit shorter for their actual bone age. So it gives you a context of growth potential. So uh, these are the growth charts that we use in our clinic and the, the top one is height and the bottom one is weight and then these are the puberty stages, the ages of the different puberty stages that I was telling you about. And uh, that bold line in the middle, that's the one that I showed you right at the beginning, the average line. And so the sort of pink zones, if you like, pink at the bottom is you're getting a bit short and pink at the top as you're getting a bit tall. And ditto for the weight, underweight, overweight. And then um, we would usually classify shortness, being short, as being below this pink zone. And that's, these lines are called centiles and they, they represent proportions of the population. So the 50th centile, which is the bold one in the middle, the average, means that your height is on the average, so 50% of people, people will be taller than you and 50% shorter. When you get down to this one here, the 0.4, that means that there's only 0.4% of people who will be shorter than you, and 99.6% of people will be taller, so you are pretty short. And as uh, I alluded to before, you should always think about the height of your child in relation to parents. So on here, I put a mid-parental target and there's a way that you work that out for the mother and the father, because if it's a girl, you have to take some height off the father. If it's a boy, you have to push up the mother's height to get a corrected parental height. So in this case, 
you've got a child who's short, but they come from short parents, so actually that's probably okay. So it's always good to think about growth in the context of the parental contribution. Uh, and, and then uh, just at the bottom here, by and large, if you're growing more than five centimetres a year in the pre pubertal years, so that's a couple of inches a year, if you're growing more than that, that's roughly normal. Uh, if you're growing more than eight centimetres a year, so that's about three inches or so, slightly more, in the puberty years, you're probably doing all right. Okay. So what are the causes that we see in our clinic uh, at the children's hospital for poor growth? Well, um, one of the commonest is that the tempo of a child's growth is a bit slow. So, um, uh, it's kind of uh, a bit like the, the hare and the tortoise, and there are some children who are hares in terms of growth, and others who are tortoises, and they get there in the end, but they're very slow. Genetic, I just mentioned that if your parents are a bit short. Uh, we know that children who are born small, some of them always remain small. In terms of worldwide, not so much in the UK, but in terms of worldwide, if you don't get fed properly, you don't grow very well. And we know that chronic illnesses, so heart problems, tummy problems, kidney problems, in general, uh, can slow growth. If children aren't loved, they don't grow very well either. If children have abnormal bones, they don't grow properly. And then we know that there are recognized conditions with an associated growth problem. So one of the classic ones that we see are girls who are missing one of their X chromosomes, it's a condition called Turner syndrome. And then there are conditions such as what we're here for today, the Noonan Costello TFC. And, and actually there is likely an inherent problem with growth in those conditions, but some of these other ones might also contribute um, and then, of course, at the bottom there, there are hormonal deficiencies. And growth hormone deficiency is the commonest of those hormonal deficiencies, and I'm going to come back to that. <coughs> In fact, I'm going to come back to it right now. On the left-hand panel are two brothers. So tell me which one is older, okay? Is it this guy on the left, or is it that guy on the right? Who's the older one? So, the one on the right is old. This one here is older. Okay, any other thoughts? The twins. Yeah, very good, very good. Yes, they're twins. And the one on the right has got growth from one deficiency. So he doesn't look remarkably different from his twin brother, but he's a long way shorter. <coughs> and of course, what happens with growth hormone deficiency is that the growth rate falls away from the normal lines. So you've got decelerating growth, and you put growth hormone in, and you get fantastic acceleration of growth. And of these two, they're grown up now, actually, the guy on the right with the growth hormone deficiency ended up taller than his twin, who was mighty mid. <laughs> okay, so you've seen this before, and I know it's terribly complicated, um, but I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that the start of this pathway is through growth factor signaling. So all the things that Emma was talking about, all these proteins that go wrong in the conditions, they're all upstream of growth factor. So actually, growth hormone itself uses this pathway. So you think these are activated pathways, so why should short stature be a problem? And actually, that is quite a tricky one to wrestle with. And I think from the growth point of view, although these pathways are active, they kind of burn themselves out from the growth point of view which is why you end up short. But it's just something to bear in mind when we come on to think a bit more about growth hormone. 
So, um, it was quite a long time ago, Colin, that you collected. This is some of your collections, I think, of height. Yeah. And so this is a boy's chart of a lad with Costello. And this is height on the left. So I've just got the little panel from the first few years of life <coughs> and the weight. And you can see that this particular child with Costello was falling away from those normal centiles very early on in life. Um, and also was not doing too badly with weight, but it wasn't brilliant. And then on this one, there's actually three children on here. So if you just focus on this one here, this is one girl. And then we, we didn't have any more height measurements until uh, the end of growth. And she ended up about four foot 10. And then there was this one here, <coughs> who ended up about four inches shorter. And their equivalent weight trajectories on this side. And then this was from a long time ago, but this particular child who had fallen off in growth was put onto growth hormone. And can you see how the growth curve there was falling? And on growth hormone, the growth curve was starting to go up. So that was information that Colin collected from quite a while ago. And actually, you heard today about the um, creation of Costello growth charts that was done by the, the US team. And this is from a medical publication from, uh, it was only a couple of years ago, I think. And what I've done here, this is the first three years height, and then that's naught to 10 years. And all a bit confusing on here, but the dashed lines, can you see there's a red, blue, and a black dash line. They are the 5th, 50th, and 95th centiles for normal children. Okay? And then the solid lines, the red, the blue, and the black, are the curves derived from uh, 94 children with Costello. About half female, half male. Um, now, Normal growth charts are usually created on the basis of hundreds, if not thousands, of growth measurements. So 94 is rather a small number. But actually, it gives you a bit of an idea of the overall trajectory of, of growth in Costello. And Bron mentioned earlier on that the tallest, so if we go over here, the black solid line, the tallest Costello children tend to just about get into the lower end of the normal range. But the shortest Costello children are much further down there, this red line here. Um, so essentially, there's a kind of shift downwards from the normal range. Um, and the other thing that was done here is that boys and girls were put together on the same chart because of numbers. And actually, from the, in the pre puberty years up to 10, that probably doesn't make much difference. It would make a bit of a difference when you go into puberty. There was a comment in this paper that some of these children, some of the 94, had been treated with growth hormone. Now, they didn't use their post-growth hormone measurements because that wouldn't be right to have people with or without growth hormone treatment. But they made a comment that there wasn't a particularly brilliant height change on growth hormone in those 15. However, I think we should think about growth hormone. And this little cartoon here is just to tell you a little bit about growth hormone. So this thing here is a cartoon picture of the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland sits at the base of the brain, sort of in between your eyes. If you were able to stick your finger into your brain from just above your eyes, you come in over the pituitary gland, so it's right in the middle of the brain. And the pituitary gland produces growth hormone, and it puts the growth hormone into the bloodstream, it circulates around the body, it goes to the bones, it goes to the fat, it goes to the muscle, it goes all over. But obviously the growing bit happens in the bones, so it goes to the bones, it produces something called IGF-1, insulin like growth factor 1, and that's what makes growing happen. But actually, it's important to muscle and it's important to fat, amongst other things. 
So if we see a child, irrespective of their background diagnosis, whose growth rate is failing, and there aren't obvious other explanations, I think it's always worth having a look at growth hormone. So the way that we do that is you can do some single tests. You can measure IGF-1, because that's downstream of growth hormone. But actually, you really need to have a proper stimulation test, and that involves coming in as a day case. It doesn't mean the child doesn't need to be in overnight. They just need to come in as a day case. It, need, it involves a cannula. It involves multiple blood samples. So it's not the most fun day, but it's an okay day. Growth hormone can be measured. IGF-1 can be measured. And we can measure all the other hormones if we thought there was a problem. And hypothyroidism was mentioned earlier on. Dead easy. If you're worried about hypothyroidism, you just get a thyroid function measurement. Very easy. So those are the things that we would do. And if you go into the literature, so it is something to bear in mind. And here's two more examples. Um, sorry, one example. This is the height on the left and weight on the right. And you can see growth hormone has started at this point in time. The child was growing slowly, falling away from the centiles, ends up in the centiles. Because one of the things that you sometimes find growth hormone does is that it also improves appetite. Um, and, and therefore, you can see in that child that improving the growth in height also improved the weight performance. Uh, <coughs> This is somebody's growth chart who we know very well. And uh, you can see that we did some testing at four years of age. And actually, at around that time, the growth hormone level, that number there, 15, was actually not too bad. But the IGF-1, that's the hormone below growth hormone, that was rather low. And we tested again at six, and actually the growth hormone was low at that stage, having been normally was low. And therefore, growth hormone was used at this point and actually did lead to some useful growth. Now, this particular individual, you all know, um, had lots of problems with her back. And of course, it's very difficult to know exactly what proper height would be when your back's very turned. Uh, but uh, she also uh, got retested again at the end of growth and still had a rather low growth hormone and a rather low IGF-1, and so we're still supplementing her with growth hormone. So, just having a little bit of a, a general thing about growth hormone treatment in lassopathies, um, what are the advantages and the disadvantages, the fours and the against? Well, in Noonan syndrome, growth hormone has been used quite extensively, and it's actually, because it's a common condition, and we know that some Noonan syndrome have a, a, a growth problem, um, and the evidence is that it does improve on average, it improves growth to a useful amount, and it seems to be safe, which is very, very important. And, for instance, one sometimes worries about hearts and growth hormone. If you've got a condition where your heart is going to hypertrophy and you give a growth agent, will you make the hypertrophy worse? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. And I think the other thing that's important is the benefits beyond growth. And actually improving muscle strength, keeping the fat at bay, helping with bone development, are all things that you can't see necessarily, but actually are important. And I think, you know, we get reported a lot of sort of anecdotal evidence. We've heard the quote about anecdotal evidence, so beware. But actually, we, we know from trials in lots of growth hormone treated conditions that growth hormone definitely increases muscle mass. And we hear anecdotally that functionally that helps some children quite considerably. Um, one condition called prada willi syndrome, where the children get very, very fat um, and they have very poor muscle tone, it is fantastic for increasing muscle strength. And I think that that's important here as well. What about the 
against? Well, there's never been a full clinical trial in Costello CFC, sort of randomized, if you like, trial of growth hormone treatment. But I've shown you the anecdotal evidence for what it's worth. But I think that for me, to look at the growth hormone levels, if the growth hormone levels are low, to think about a trial of growth hormone is a very reasonable thing to do. But you do have to think about your risks and your benefits. You know, is how important is the height? Um, there has always been an issue in people's minds about tumours and growth hormone. Giving a growth promoting agent in somebody who either has a predisposition to tumours or who's already had a tumour. Now, the evidence from lots of different situations, and I'm not here talking about just Costello CFC, the evidence is that growth hormone doesn't either induce occurrence of tumour or recurrence of tumour. Um, and, and that evidence is primarily from children who have had brain tumours, have got growth hormone deficiency because of their brain tumour treatment, and then been treated with growth hormone. So a pretty serious scenario that it's been tested out in. What is less clear, because we don't have the abundant evidence, is could the exposure to growth hormone during the childhood years predispose individuals to have tumours more frequently in later life? And actually, we've started in Europe a surveillance study right across Europe to have a look at that very question. Um, and from the preliminary evidence in a very, very large number of children, there may be one or two tumours where there is a slightly higher incidence, but in general, this is a very uh, safe treatment. I've mentioned the cardiac problems. Glucose problems, actually, if there are problems with low blood sugar, <coughs> growth hormone is actually quite helpful because your body, your naturally, growth hormone is what's called a counter-regulatory hormone. So if you drop your blood sugar, your growth hormone level goes up to compensate. Of course, if you've got growth hormone deficiency, it can't do that. You can get low blood sugar with growth hormone deficiency. And I suppose we should, well, importantly, we should not forget the burden of growth hormone treatment, I'm afraid, comes on the end of a needle. And it's a, at the present moment, it's a daily injection. Although those of you who know people with insulin, with diabetes and have to have insulin, it's a cartridge, it's a pen system, so you dial a dose in. It's a tiny little needle, it's not like having a blood test, it's a tiny needle. And actually, preparations are being developed for one weekly or two weekly uh, administration of growth hormones. I think that will come online in the not too distant future. But if there's a lot of other stuff happening around your child, it may not be important. It may not be important to worry about the growth. But I think just to have the opportunity to be able to think about that, have the opportunity for somebody to look at the growth of your child is really important. In terms of Noonan's syndrome, so, so this is where the, the um, probably the sort of benefit that you can get from growth hormone to height over a relatively long period of treatment is going to be somewhere in the region of three inches or so gained over what you would have got. So you just have to think, that's a, another thing, is is it important enough, or are there more important things health-wise for my child? Um, uh, so I think, just to finish off, in terms of strategy for managing growth, if you're worried about your child's growth, then get a referral to your local or your paediatric endocrinologist. So paediatric endocrinologists are based in tertiary children's hospitals by and large. And that paediatric endocrinologist can then evaluate serial growth measurements, can decide whether it's worth 
going down the growth hormone investigation <laughs> pathway. And if your your CSC Costello child happens to be one of the taller ones, then it probably isn't important to do that. But if they're down the bottom, it's worth the call. And then if the growth hormone levels are low, or sometimes even if the growth hormone levels are still a little bit okay, but <coughs> borderline, it might be worth considering a trial of treatment. And what I mean by that is actually just start the treatment and see what happens. If they grow brilliantly without any side effects, I would continue. If the child doesn't grow very well, or growth hormone then stop it. There's no point to filling them with uh, a potent drug if it's not having any, any value. And for safety, uh, to have serial echoes, the ultrasound that have been talked about earlier on, uh, which would be happening anyway, but make sure that they're falling in line with the, the trial and treatment. And we monitor, it's, this IGF-1 is relatively easy to measure, just take a sample in clinic. And we, we know what the normal levels of IGF-1 should be. So what we do is to try and keep the IGF-1 levels within the normal range uh, as um, a marker for safety. And just be cautious with the growth hormone dose. We don't want to try and give pocket fulls of growth hormone high IGF-1 levels. That would be irresponsible. But uh, this is, I think, the strategy that's reasonable to adopt for managing the growth disorders. And I think that's what Dan in the States is doing this kind of thing. So I'm going to leave it there. I know hypoglycemia was mentioned. I'm very happy to answer questions on anything related to growth, puberty, whatever you like. Thank you. Um, what recommendations do you have if you've already gone to a local and there's not a piece of the name and search and they would not recommend to go to a local and Right, right. Um, it was slightly tricky to <laughs> make a comment in intellectual cases, but I think that um, in this day and age, parent power is at your disposal and if you felt that you needed to have opinions elsewhere and I can understand that view well I think and um, I think Captain Colin will remember when I embarked on this I did it with uh, extreme reluctance <laughs> well it was a long time ago we didn't have very really much experience at all and I kind of held my breath but it has gone well I think it, it was, you know, you need to look at all the individual circumstances when making a decision, but parent power can run that. One thing that Dan Doyle is recommending is an MRI before you embark on the pituitary. What's your view on that? Yeah, I think that's very sensible. Uh, in any child we find in which we make a definitive diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency, and actually that involves doing two of those stimulation tests. Yeah. We would follow that up with an MRI to look particularly at the uh, structure of the pituitary gland. And oh. there are certain appearances that we would see around the pituitary gland or that would help us to e be even more confident that growth hormone deficiency was a problem. So yeah, I would definitely Good. recommend that. One interesting thing that Angela Lane noticed in her study was that there's about that she identified six people where the hypertrophy improved on growth hormone, which was interesting that she raised at the last meeting before she stepped down from the thing. Have you any comments? The the hypertrophy improved. The hypertrophy of which bit? Oh, the cardiac <coughs> the hypertrophy. Heart, right. Okay. That's interesting. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'd understand how it might improve unless you know, it increases the rest of you and reduces the afterload on the heart and that therefore allows the muscles to, to, to improve. But it was just an interesting yeah, thing that she raised in her last yeah. paper. Yeah. Sorry, there was a lady. Yeah. Ask them if you, it's got CFC, we've been using um, growth hormone really successfully for the last five or six years now. I was just wondering, does it matter where you inject? Because people only really tolerate it in the arms, and the doctors keep saying, you know, we need to do it in other places. Yeah. But you can come and inject it anywhere. The key is rotation. So if you only want it in his arms, as long as you keep rotating and kind of moving it up and down a bit, then that's fine. 
So if you put it in legs, it won't make his legs grow. Because <laughs> no, it gets into the bloodstream and it goes over the Just <laughs> Sorry, no. Yes, you were uh, just wanted to know, uh, does it affect life expectancy? Uh, if, you know, if uh, we don't want to, to give, we, we decide not to give the child uh, growth hormone, does it affect? Uh, I... I don't have that uh, level of information. I don't think anybody would be able to answer that. I don't think there's any evidence for that. Yeah. Because uh, the, the uh, just, we were told that uh, it no. was, I mean, uh, we were told we, we had to, to give growth hormone because of life expectancy. Oh, I, I think that's, a, that's okay. pushing it a bit. Yes, I, I, <laughs> yes. I don't, because the, the oldest people with Costello syndrome yeah. who would now be in their late 40s wouldn't have had growth hormone. Uh, yeah, yes, they just true. wouldn't have. And, and you know, so there's the two Australian women in their 30s, late yes. 30s, and there were the original New Zealand cases. So, so I don't think there's any evidence. So you ju for that just said that to make us feel guilty about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just. I think that's this. a tough one. I, I mean, you could. So in adults with growth hormone deficiency, I don't mean Costello, just general growth hormone deficiency in adults, it is given as replacement to improve quality of life, yes. not longevity, but quality of life. Yes. And I think some of my alluding to, it might all, not always be height that you're after, but muscle strength, bone strength, appetite improvements, general well-being, there are arguments to say that uh, it helps with quality of life. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, it's kind of what's the chart. There isn't really enough evidence to know what is the optimal time i would i would do it on the basis of if the, at the point at which the growth is falling off of course if you are right over on the right hand side of your growth chart in puberty there ain't much point then because you've got very little growth left to come. so you're better on you as a general rule in growth from a treatment you're better off having your treatment earlier rather than later It depends how far below. It depends on the rate. So if he's kind of parallel in the bottom lines, then that's probably okay. I'm more thinking about when, as, as the examples I've shown you, are children who've clearly fallen away. Yes. So if, if you don't have the growth hormone deficiency, uh, does, and you give the growth hormone, does it uh, also not give you the benefit of bone density or anything? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so there are quite a number of conditions, including Noonan syndrome, which has never really been associated classically with growth hormone deficiency, where growth hormone is given as extra to what the body's had, and you still get impacts on all of the systems. Um, maybe they're not quite as impressive as when you're growth hormone deficient, but you can still get impact. But it could be a reason to give it. That, yes. So I, I did mention. I think if the child was very, very short, right. even against the say the Costello standards, but the growth hormone came back normal, there still might be a, a case to argue for a trial of treatment. Because in this country, we have a number of conditions for which there is a licensed growth hormone. Those are the prescribable indications. If you are going to do this for a non-growth hormone deficient Costello child, you would have to make a very good case that this was worth doing. Yeah. You mentioned the possibility of making a trial period, but how long should it last to draw the conclusion, okay, it's just one of Yeah, so uh, if you're giving a trial, then you can't really evaluate overall impact in less than six months. And probably, because you might want to dose escalate, 12 months. 
So I, I think it's really important with your doctor when you're starting out is to have a discussion about expectation. And, and the doctor can give you their expectation. You can have your expectations. You come somewhere together and decide what it would be that would trigger stopping or continuing. I think that's really important. Okay, so I think we've got a break for lunch. Um, Opportunity for questions over lunch and that is after that. And if we come back properly at 1.30, I'll do the cancel talk in 15 minutes, which is just a couple of important things to say.